three, two, one. Boom! And welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Lucky Duck. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. Best day frames on the market, and they've also got a five star crash test rated dog kennel. So, with the air conditioning system in it. That's right. Got a little fan. Lou is very spoiled. So, how's Lou feeling? Lou was sick earlier this week. He's had the uh, rip roaring shits for about a week. Is but, he not getting uh, any better now? Uh, it was a little bit better yesterday. Wasn't just solid liquid. Uh, vet said put him on high fiber. So he's on apples and pumpkin and chicken. Fucker's living good. And he ain't going to want to go back and, to eating that other he, shit. And he, he turns his nose up at regular dog food. I don't blame him. I would so. too. You need. I've created a monster. Yep. Got you a yuppie dog. Yuppie with a yuppie dog. Mm-hmm. With us today from Oregon, Mr. Stan Wickersham. Did I say the last name right? Or did I fuck it all up? You I did. Good deal. I'm on a roll today. We got it. Now, tell me your story. You are an older gentleman. You're past 50, correct? Like I am. Yeah, 74. 74. And you've been waterfowl hunting and hunting your whole life, correct? All the way. Mainly, early years was duck hunting, pheasant hunting uh, in the northern uh, Sacramento Valley, around Willows, uh, California. And then I went into dog hunting and been a disease that I've had my whole life. <laughs> it's dog hunting? Hound hunting. Uh, bears and cougars and coons and what have you and little varmint calling and little elk hunting and deer hunting through my life. How has how has the hunting changed with dogs since you when you were a kid, when you were started doing it to today? Is it harder to access property than it used to be? Well, yes. Yes, it is on some properties. Uh, I became an agent after uh, Major 18 that shut bear hunting and cougar hunting down about 25 years ago in Oregon. And I become an agent to timber companies and I could pursue it. Uh, They had bear problems. At a certain time of the year when when uh, they first come out of hibernation, there's nothing for them to eat, and they get to girdle in trees, and they eat the Cambrian uh, new growth on a tree that's darn near ready to harvest, and it, one barrel ruined 35, 40 trees in the spring, and they'd have us go in there and hunt them. So, I did not know that. I, did, I didn't either. So they eat the bark off the the new bark off of trees is what they're eating. Yeah, they're they're going for that sweet cambrium, uh, and they'll completely girdle a tree, and you don't see it the first year. You look up on a mountainside, and there's, you know, you, you can see a mile, and you look at it, binoculars, everything looks good. But come next spring. You got what you call flag trees. These trees are turning brown. And if you walk up to them, there won't be any bark on them from the ground as high up. I've seen it 10 or 15 feet up. They're, they'll eat all the bark off all the limbs in the main trunk. And it just kills the tree. Well, these guys are in business to grow trees. And uh, so they, they just got to do something about it. I, there's tra- there's trappers and snare men and dog hunters and all that kind of stuff. I would how we took care. Of it. I would have never have known that or guessed that in my entire life. And I'm assuming a, a fully grown mature tree you're going to chop down is worth ten to fifty thousand dollars, maybe per tree. Well, I have I have no idea because I'm not a logger. I can't quote you a price on it. But if you took thirty trees. You ain't putting 30 trees on a log truck, so maybe you put five trees on a log truck. That's twelve, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 load that's not worth anything anymore. And you can't get it out because they're not ready to log that piece, so there's no roads into that area. So you got one, one tree and 500 yards across the mountain. You got three trees. You can't get to them, so they go to hell, Mm. you know, before they can get in to log it. What kind of trees are those? They're fir trees, pine, 
Spurs. That's what I was trying to look up, but how yeah, about a thousand dollars a tree. That's what they cost if you bought a full grown one, so Right. Right. I know it's quite expensive, you know, if a lot of these places got a thousand acres, you know, it's been in their families for years and that's how they make a living is they take so many trees out each year because so, they're coming back. They replant. There's, there's laws when you log a little area, you got so much time to plant, replant. And then 30 years down the road, you can, or 20 years down the road, however it is, I don't know the figures, but uh, that, that's their kids is living coming up. Yeah, that, that's, that's crazy. I, I would have never guessed that about a bear eating a tree up where it wouldn't be worth anything. I never would have even thought that. So <clears throat> what, what kind of bears are we getting here? We're getting brown bears, black bears. They're just a black bear, just a standard black bear. Uh, they're not grizzlies or anything like that. Uh, they claim over on the coast, uh, around Brookings and North up into that country. They claim that there's a bear every square mile. Wow. I stayed in Brookings for a couple of days in February and I didn't see a bear anywhere, but I, I did know I did talk to some people and them, them bears don't hibernate up there, do they? Well, they kind of slow down. They don't really go into a deep cold sleep with four foot of snow on them because they don't get that. Uh, I've caught tree bears and uh, coon hunting over there, or bobcat hunting and and having bear dogs, they'll go over and bay in a big stump, and I'll get over there to catch them and look in there, and there'll be a bear. I've done that a couple of times. Those are some big ass trees too, especially when you get down in California in that redwood forest. Woof! That's some big ass trees for a bear. Oh, those are giants. Those are giants down there. Oh man, beautiful, beautiful place. I highly recommend everyone who needs to go see that. It's it's. What did you do? What did you do when you were in Brookings? Nothing relaxed read read, yeah. read a book looked out a window and looked at the ocean just enjoyed the time it's just a beautiful place up there very peaceful and nice brookings was a nice town when we got into california there was a bunch of homeless problems but brookings i didn't notice a lot right. of it brookings was more regular type people i would say it i never seen so many hippies or rednecks in my entire life until northern california right right we spent the wife and i spent two months two and a half months north of that by about 60 miles last summer i'm not much of a i don't know the coast the, the actual ocean but i know the the bear hunting in from the ocean in 40 50 miles that's where i did a lot of bear hunting that's some pretty pretty country up there so did you duck hunt up there also growing up in that area no no i grew up in willows california uh well, actually, it was a little town called Artois between Willows and Orland, uh, about 20 miles above. I believe it was Grayback Duck Refuge. I don't know. You guys have might might have seen it, rice fields and stuff. And we, my dad had a dairy there, and, and the pheasants, when I was 8 or 10 years old, were thick. I started out pheasant hunting a lot. And I'd do a little goose hunting, and I did everything kind of solo uh, off of a horse, and I had a real nice lab, golden lab, and he, everybody told me he was no good because I taught him to point, <laughs> but I did it on horses. <laughs> now they're breeding pointing labs, I guess. <laughs> I, okay, I went uh, through... I went through willows when I was up there. It was it went from almond trees to rice farms everywhere, and there was right. a, and there was a right. lot of ducks when I was there. When you were when you were a kid growing up there, there wasn't as many, there wasn't that many liberals in California then. It was just about like being everywhere else, right? Right. It was it was beautiful growing up. I didn't have any trouble, and you you know when you born and raised in that country, you knew every rancher. You didn't even have to ask to go hunting. You. You did out of courtesy, you know, say, I'm going to be down on your South 40 hunting. Okay. Take my kid or maybe he's got a kid my age. I'd take him. 
and we'd get together and do things. And I did everything on a horse back then. I don't know. I just, I pheasant hunted off of a horse. I duck hunted and goose hunted off of a horse. Uh, it was a whole lot easier and a lot of fun <laughs> when you're a kid. <laughs> so what would you do? You'd ride up to these ducks and geese and just be ready to go on the horse or what? Yeah, on the on the geese, they'd land in them fields, and I'd saddle my horse up and extend the right stirrup about eight or ten inches, and all I had back then was a single-shot 410 shotgun. I'd put two or three shells in my mouth, and that, and I'd ride up there till they started. You know, I could get five feet from the whole herd, because I'd slow that horse down and let him... They just think it's a cow or a horse, and when they started leaving the ground, I'd just shoot every shell I could get in there fast enough, and then spend an hour down my wounded birds, you know, with that horse, and I'd tie them on the saddle horn, take them home, and breast them out, and make jerky out of the breast. Really? So you could <laughs> extend your right stirrup enough to where you could get on that side of the horse yeah and so the birds yeah. never even saw uh, you coming have... up right that makes right. sense <laughs> and then pheasant hunting i'd I, that horse i teach her to pull her head around and down first couple times she went to the barn and i had to walk to the barn but <laughs> uh after a while she <laughs> I've had some wrecks out there. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any that you know. were uh, life-threatening? Any injuries from these wrecks? No, not really. Bruised up. You know how it's get bucked off their horse get, you know. I didn't. I was lucky. Uh, yeah, because back then, I was pretty no tough. cell phones in, so you break your leg, you're just out of luck. Yeah. Yeah. That was one thing that my folks were good at they'd let me do anything i wanted to do as long as they knew where i was and about what time i was coming home that's crazy so i'd i'd go down at times pheasant hunting get a sleeping bag and a kid and go down to the creek and be gone for two days you know as long as they knew where i was and when i was coming home they were good about how old it. were you at this time Ten to thirteen. I've like got a that. nine-year-old. I would never. I would never be comfortable doing that. That's because the world's different now. Even it's when, not. It's not different. Yeah, 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 it is. Kids are different today. Kids are pussies today compared to what they used to be like. Am I right, Stan? You're right. They You're are right. They can't. You're right. We think anything. Yeah. You can't. You know. So when I was that age. To make extra money, I'd go out with a pickup and a trailer and roll 200-pound bales up on a platform. I couldn't lift them, but I'd figure out, and my folks would give me 10 cents a bale to bring them to the barn. <laughs> At that same age, 10 to 13. Yeah. 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 There was a time that what uh, the I think you could get a driver's license at 14 at one time. It was before my time, but kids were just different then. I mean, we did... It, I didn't grow up as a country boy, really, but I, I guess I did because I did a lot of stuff outside. But, I mean, we would walk at Reese's age. I would walk a mile to go buy fireworks across the highway and everything else. Nobody thought nothing of it. And, that was, and it wasn't like anybody was like, oh, look at them poor kids over there because all kids did that shit. Kids today, we as a society have coddled our kids too much. Kids aren't dumb and they're not soft. We make them that way. But you would be a nervous. Well, they got to they got to take these cell phones and stuff away yeah. from them. And, but what else is there to do in these big cities? You know, these kids don't know anything. Yeah. Like like you said, though, like Andy, if Andy, if, or if Reese and one of his buddies went out and just behind the lodge here on the river went and camped out for a couple of days, it would drive right. you crazy. Yeah. But when we were kids doing it, your dad, my dad might come up and check on us once in the afternoon to make sure we're okay. Okay, see you tomorrow and go leave. Mm -hmm. And then think nothing yeah. of it. Mine, mine did the same yeah. thing. I've had the cops pull in. I remember one situation where we went. I lived in a little town between Orland and Willows called Artois. 
And I went first through the eighth grade in a room, two rooms with two different teachers. So it was really small. But seven miles south was Willows, was a bigger town. And then about eight miles north was Oregon, was a bigger town. And they, we had this one school that all the kids knew everybody. Uh, you did you did things together uh, as kids. And, and the Highway 99 run through there, Interstate 5 wasn't in that country anymore. And then you had all those those hobos that were running up and down uh, following five and there's a train tracks there and they were going north to pick fruit and south and we'd meet them. There was a couple of guys that I met that traveled every year and they'd go to the post office and call and see if Stan was there uh, at my house and I'd meet him down there and stay a night with him underneath the bridge Drinking out of drinking their coffee out of a coffee can, and <laughs> you know maybe shoot a pheasant on the way down there, and they'd cook it up. And I, they were real interesting people, nice people. They were just homeless, right? But a did they were, ho they were hobos, is what they were. Yeah, and your parents thought nothing of it. Yeah, go down there, have a nice night with the hobos. Yeah, well, after. You know, there was two or three of them in my life that came through every year, twice, either going north or going south. Right. And I knew them as Joe and Sam, and I knew them personally. I never took them home to feed them or anything like that. They were only spending a night there, maybe two, you know, on that creek. And I, you didn't think anything of getting in trouble in or somebody going to beat you up or mm -hmm rape you or anything like that you just it, you didn't think about it so is that how you met the hobos you were down there fishing or something or, or hunting and you came across them like how did yeah. you initially meet the hobos i'd ride in on them <laughs> with a horse and ride in there and say how you doing yeah you know uh where are you from where are you going some of them cuss you out and tell you get the hell out of dodge and i'd leave <laughs> but some of them are real friendly <laughs> They just riding the rails, trying to earn a living. Just a hobo riding the yeah. rails. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, uh, Did they have that sack on them like you see? With the stick and then well, a little that's bandana That's they carried all their up. shit. That was yeah. their luggage. <laughs> some, some of them did. Really? Some of them didn't. That, some of them were real glad to see me come in there because I always had some groceries. Yeah. Always had a pheasant or something. Oh, yeah. And if you didn't, there were so many pheasants down there in that country. It only takes 10 minutes to go out and shoot one. Those, those, guys, the, those guys would go from town to town, and they didn't have missions and all that stuff everywhere to take care of you and stuff, but they knew where they could get a handout in every town. But that, oh they, yeah, they, they had their marks that they knew they could get through. But the town would run them out. The town would, like, we're going to feed you, but we're going to take you to the next town. You're their problem. Oh, I've seen Andy Griffith. I know. That's the same. same Andy Griffith is the way they handled them. You got to go. They feed you, right. but they get you out of town. You don't want to work and stuff. You're vagrant. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. So I and, watched them. I know. Listen, Opie, friend, Opie did the same thing Stan did here. Friend of the hobo. Yeah. Andy was not happy. Yeah. No. Like, listen, you're teaching them bad habits. But this, this hobo didn't want to work. So Andy's like, you know, you got to go. You he gotta, was stealing the pies. Get on out of here. So... You started running dogs on bears. Tell us about your first bear hunt with a dog. Well, there was a neighbor down there in that town that had dogs. And I was about, probably about 10 or 12. He's, and he knew my folks. He decided, uh, asked me if I wanted to go bear hunting. And we drove up and, oh, 35 miles west and there's bears and we didn't catch a bear but i got to listen to these two guys talking about their hunt and the bear hunting didn't start until i was about 20 but i did a lot of coon hunting back there with them guys and really liked that uh, but my folks wouldn't ever let me have a dog uh, i wanted my own dogs and I got I got married at about 19 years old, and I moved to Oregon. 
I run into a guy, a hound truck, and he had a dog, and he said, well, let's go coon hunting tonight, and we did, and by the next day, he had a litter of pups. I traded my 22 rifle for one of them pups, an old beat-up rifle I had. Started hunting, and I've been doing it ever since, until a year ago. I've got rid of all my dogs, and I'm trying to... My wife's retired now, and we're trying to do a little fishing, and I figured she never went with me. Uh, oh, on occasion, she'd go, but... I, this is the first year I've been without hounds in my whole life, and it's damn hard on me. Is too. it? <laughs> yeah, I did. My it dad could have never done I that. Did it. Just not having the companionship, or what? No, it's hound hunting is a disease, and it's not the hunting and the killing. It's taking a good young dog, which you guys would probably know. It's the same thing as your bird yeah. hunting. You take a good pup bred out of your best dog and by the time he's two years old he when he starts making you really proud that's that's dog yeah. hunt uh, the other stuff sideline stuff as far as i'm concerned yeah yeah i've i've um my dog's 11 so i've got a couple more years with him but i'm i'm resigned to the fact that there's going to be a year because I, i'm not going to get another dog until he passes away just because, you know, right. he's been with me. He was my first dog that, you know, I trained and, um, I've got enough respect for him that I'm going to let him finish out his days as being my only hunting dog. I would feel bad if right. I got a puppy and he lived for another three years and I was having to rotate the two of them. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep my dog until he passes away or can't do it anymore. And then. Then I'll get another dog. But I know there's going to be a year in there where I'm probably not going to have a dog. And I don't know how that's going to be because I'm used to not having to go out there for the long cripples or the long retrieves. I just send him and do it. Right, right. The hound hunting is a little different. You know, I never hunted a lot of dogs. Some guys hunt down in Texas in your country. Some of them cat hunters down there, they hunt 20 dogs. Mm -hmm. And I... I always felt that you'll make a better dog the fewer dogs you had. So I kept about four and always brought a pup on. Mm -hmm. And that those older dogs taught the young dog what to do. And then I always kept two pups for a while and got rid of, sold or culled or whatever I had to do to keep my pack going. Because as soon as you lose that old dog mainly bear hunting about about nine or ten years old they start falling behind them young dogs are supposed to run up yeah. front and carry him he'll come through and help them if it, if they can get a bear stopped but he, they're not going to stop that bear if it's a running bear or a real mean bear you know that you gotta walk down and there's a lot of those bears that you, they ain't gonna tree. Uh, you just got to get them stopped up against a tree or check the wind and come in the other side and, and shoot him on the ground. Uh, those are the type of bears that a bear hunter really likes. It, it, your dogs are working good and you're in the situation. And a lot of times you're in the situation where you're, well, the coast is so thick, I walked ahead of my lead dog bay and hard four or five feet before I can even see the bear hmm. to get him killed. It, it can get mm -hmm. rough. Yeah. Uh, different, different country, open country is a whole different story, too. You can see 40 yards. What, uh, when yards. you were, when you were coon hunting before you were bear hunting, did you ever come upon a bear? Your dogs were on a, run on a bear by accident yeah i tell you the first bear that i really caught i i there was a guy in town that hunt bear hunted and his kid i run around with a lot james he took us up to trinity center and he'd go up there on the weekends because he worked but he left James and I at Trinity Center at a campground, 
and one old, his old dog, and we'd coon hunt around there, and all we had was a single shot twenty two rifle and a couple of fishing poles, and he'd bring us food. We stayed the whole summer, me and James up there in this campground. We treed one night thinking it was a coon, and we couldn't see it, and uh, James and I climbed that tree with a flashlight and a string on that gun to get up there. We was up 60 feet in this big old tree, and I come over a limb, and there's a barefoot sitting right there eight inches wow. from me, and I start. I started hollering, and James and I and the bear came out. We never killed the bear. <laughs> and it was one of them giant trees that was like probably eight foot at the butt, you know, with big limbs on it. And it was right in a campground with nobody camping in it, just me and James. And that kind of fired us up. We thought, this is pretty neat. And the next thing I know, I got older and I wanted to do it and I got lucky and met a guy that knew how to bear hunt and was a good bear hunter. And he took me under his wing and that was in, I was thinking about it last night. It was in 1969. That guy and I caught 67 bears out of diamond Lake dump uh, up here in Oregon. I had moved to Oregon by that time. What, what, and 67 bears in a summer is a lot yeah, of bears. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what'd you do with them all? If they were sows and cubs, we left them. Uh, and then we were catching hell because we were leaving them because back then they were still dropping strip nine horse baits in areas to kill these bears. But I didn't. I didn't really feel that killing a cub was, and we ate our bears. We, we gutted them out and brought them in and gave them to homeless or gave them to people or put them in our freezer. Did you ever get like trichinosis or anything from it? No, you got to cook them. You, you can cook that out of them or you can freeze it out of them. Oh, really? How yeah. long do you have to freeze them for it to be not to not be a problem anymore? It's been a long time, but I think it was like thirty days. And the parasites will freeze. Yeah, is the best. Eat- and it's probably <clears throat> it probably less time than that. But just to be safe, is is the best eating on a bear the back strap like everything else? Well, I've eaten steaks. I've even had. Uh, bacon made out of it. I didn't like that. A roast is what I like. Then you can dump all the grease off of it and make sandwiches and stuff like that. A lot of people don't like it. And it depends on what the bear's eating, too, that time of the year. Uh, If they're down eating acorns, they were pretty good. If they're eating spring of the year, they come out and they get to eating skunk cabbage. Or if they're eating fish, they're terrible. Really? Yeah. That, that, and I guess if they're eating like garbage or something, just forget about it. Yeah. Well, they'll eat anything. They're nothing but a big rat, really. <laughs> they'll eat anything. Uh, back then, you could bait too. Legally, you can. I baited them in, so I. You, you got to get a starting spot. That's the key. Uh, unless you got good rig dogs, we. We got to riding over the years. I'd put my dogs on the hood of my truck or the dog box and drive a road 25, 30 miles an hour. And when they blew up, I'd stop and walk back of the truck and see how big a track it was and make sure which direction it was going and turn loose from there. And off you go. And off you go. Sometimes it was a half hour race and sometimes it was a 12 hour race and you never got them got dark on you. right i know that um I've, I've never had bear before my dad had eaten bear but he told me he coons the same way except a coon a lot of people would trap a coon and then they would feed it for three or four or five days to clean it out before they would kill it to, to eat it because it would get all the it would, they would try to feed it better and a bear is just like a big ass coon or a rat like you said a minute ago anyways 
But I've, I've heard bear meat's real greasy. I had a guy from Minnesota that hunted with me a couple of years ago, and he killed a couple of bears every year. And they would can the meat and make sloppy joes and stuff out of it. Really? Uh-huh. Right. Right. Uh, and coons, you know, there's a lot of people in down in Oakland. There was a guy in Oakland and San Francisco that, you know, we'd coon hunt. Back when the height prices were high, you know, I'd get, Fifteen twenty dollars for a coon hide green, and I'd sell the carcass for ten bucks. Uh, if the dogs didn't bruise it up too bad, or you know, it depended on me. If if I had a young dog there and he wanted to chew on a coon, that was that was a good thing for the pup. So that coon wasn't edible, but he I'd get twenty five or thirty of them and call him and meet him halfway and sell him that, and then sell my hides. Coon hides at twenty twenty five dollars a piece. Uh, you could make a living at it back then. Yeah, you know. I, mean, I don't. the The fur market's really crazy because is it just socially not accepted to have furs nowadays? Is that why there's no market on it? Yeah, I went to a fur sale three weeks ago, and the prices coons were like three dollars. Really. Uh, yeah, terrible. Bobcats were pretty good. I had a buddy that sold one cat for nine hundred and twenty dollars. Whoa, these are prime. But that's not all cats. The west there's a east cat here in Oregon, and there's a western cat. Western cats brought thirty bucks, and uh, the high country cats, high desert cats with good spots like Nevada's got good cats. Uh, where I'm sitting right now over in Lakeview's got pretty good cats. Uh, and you're only allowed five for the year here. And then there's an unlimited amount over in the west side in, on that coast range. They got good spots and good on their bellies and stuff. And, uh, I always like to hunt the good cats. I don't blame you. When I was cat hunting real heavy uh, several years ago, like 12, 14 years ago, 12 years ago, the prices were up pretty good, and I couldn't get around. I bought a Yamaha Rhino and put tracks on it, put a dog box in it, so I could get up into the high country. And it took me four years to pay for a $20,000 mm-hmm. rig. Selling cats. Selling cats. That's all you did. But then, yeah. so a cat brought nine hundred dollars. What What's the difference in that cat than a? Is it just how thick the fur is? What and what and what are they using it for? They can coach. They send them to different countries. France were buying them, and has a lot to do with with the fur marker in different countries. I think. With nine hundred dollar bobcats, I'd be looking around here for some cats. Now, these, these are bobcats, you said? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking cougars. No, no, no. What's a cougar pelt running? Well, you can't sell them because they're considered a game animal. Oh. I think you can sell them in Idaho. I think Idaho you could sell a cougar hide and, and a bear hide. But in California back then and in Oregon, uh, they're considered a game animal. And so why are th- I've caught a lot of coo- why are th- cougars over the why are Go these ahead. apex predators afraid of dogs? I've never I've never figured that out. Like cougars can take out a dog, so could can whip a, bear. a dog could whip a dog's ass fast. I mean, a bear could easily whip a dog. I mean, is it just they got the bluff in on them or what? Yeah, you hit them hard with a dog that's aggressive. Not not a single dog. Now you got to figure put it two dogs on there that know how to handle a bear and when he turns and gets bit in the ass and he's spinning around on the ground that's that you hit him right but there's bears out there that'll that don't get scared and those are the ones that are kind of dangerous mm-hmm. how many dogs have you lost not very many probably four dogs in a whole oh, life wow, of actually yeah. getting killed I've had a lot of vet bills, <laughs> a lot of, you know, uh, and I hunted a dog 
when I was bear hunting hard, if that dog quit me without holes in him, he he found a road. I got rid right. of him because uh, you got to pull your own weight. Mm-hmm. It costs just as much to feed a good dog as it does a bad one, and a bad one will teach a pup that hey, let's let's fall behind twenty yards and bark and not put any pressure, and pretty soon you're not catching anything. Right. It takes a lot of balls by a dog to go jump up on a big ass bear. How do you how do you teach the first dog? Because like you said earlier, like once you get your good dogs, they'll teach the young pups how to do it. But how how do you initially get that good dog to do what you want it to do? Well, I've tried all different ways over the years, you know, but my thought is raising a dog up. They say a dog is like seven years to one yeah. year of you age think about this you stick a seven-year-old in a bar fight what's going to happen he ain't going in back in a bar right. again he gets his ass kicked but if you start him out on a coon teaching if you teach that dog from a time he's born to a year old that he can learn and he likes you then you can start putting this other stuff on him i always I never leased my dogs hardly. I led them away from a tree and told them to follow me. And that's the way it was. They, they hunted for me, not themselves. Mm-hmm. So you have to have a connection that's with your dog. Help. You got, you have to, you have to make them want to please you. You bet. You bet. And there's bloodlines out there too. There's, there's some bloodlines in every breed, like the Walker or the blue tick or the black and tan. There's, there's bloodlines within those that make better bear dogs, and there's bloodlines in there that make better bobcat dogs. Mm. But start them out small. Don't get them hurt. Lead them to a tree when they're a year old. Or a lot of guys start their dogs at six months old, but I never believed in that. I, you can't ask a three-year-old human to crawl in a boxing ring with somebody bigger than him and tougher than him and expect him to do it the rest of his life. He'll just quit. Right. What, what is the, um, what, how do you differentiate on a dog? You, you're bear hunting and your dog gets on a bobcat trail or your dog gets on a coon trail. How do you keep them focused just on that bear? Well, if you're bobcat hunting, stay with the bobcat hunting until the bear season comes around. Uh, a lot of guys don't do anything but bobcat hunt. They break their dogs off of bears. That, that, that's what I'm saying, though. When, when you're bear hunting and you're wanting to go after a bear and you come on across a bobcat across the scene, how do you keep that dog to not chase that bobcat and to go to that bear? Stay on that bear. Well, if you keep him straight on that game and he does get on a bobcat, don't shoot it out to him and don't, don't raise him up and just go on hunt and within three weeks or a month he's thinking bears not bobcats he knows what you're out there okay. for. but if you're doing it all at the same time you're going to have a mess you're going to catch a bobcat or you're going to catch a bear or you're going to catch a coon uh, and while you're bear hunting if you see a coon track there and you got a year and a half old pup there leave your old dogs in the box and make them shut up and take that pup out there and see if you can't catch that you're, mm-hmm. you're teaching him and it ain't gonna what hurt about a skunk you get the fan belt out and kick his ass because you just <laughs> <laughs> break, break him off of it <laughs> that's the old day but anymore i used all when that electricity came out and these it's a lot easier on the dog uh, if, if he gets after a skunk and you you got a tone button there you can tone him and warn him or you can shock him from one to ten if he's just a real aggressive dog and he don't stop you just keep running the button up and usually about one time of that you got him pretty well my dad up. had an old lab named hacksaw and that some bitch like skunks and dad had beat him and hit him and <laughs> shot at his ass probably a few times and shocked him 
That dog thought dad wanted him to pick him up faster. Yeah, that's what he thought. He thought he couldn't get it. That, he thought he was disappointing my dad by not retrieving that skunk faster. And that son of a bitch would, be, would disappear yeah. in the cattails. He'd come back with a skunk in his mouth. I mean, it was. Right. My lab mm. did when I was young a lot of times. And I caused it because kids out there in the field, we see a skunk. Sometimes we take a ball bat and run up on, them on a horse and whack him in the head. And there's been a couple of times mom would meet us out by the barn. All them clothes stay <laughs> out here. And we're, mm. <laughs> I've never been sprayed by skunk and I hope I never do. Wow. What would you do? Tomato juice bath? Well, they got other ways, but tomato juice is it. And some of that skunk makes some guys really, really? sick. I didn't really get, they get to puking and their eyes get to burning and stuff like that. Have you ever, um, have you ever seen a skunk without, cause he can take out those, uh, spray glands and some people say they make good pets. Yeah. We had, we had one as a kid. We were mowing the fields and got into some little ones and we had the skunk glands taken out it just run around the house. They're like really? house cat. Would he come to you? Yeah, he'd come to you. They don't live that oh, really? long. Uh, uh, I don't know why. This one only lived a couple of years, about three years. I went to elementary like with a kid that had two of them. I barely remember. Really? Mm -hmm. He brought them to show and tell when I was in like second grade. I'll never forget it. He let you pet them? Oh, yeah. We were all petting the skunks and shit, but he had them two that were deep. They had the glands taken out. Do they still like lift their tail up? Yeah, if you scared them or stomped on the floor in front of them, pissed them off, they'd raise that tail. And nothing go through up. the motions. I saw a lady get sprayed by skunk one time. Really? Yeah, she worked for animal control, and they had one. They caught one in a cage, and you went to do it. Had, went to go pick it up, and what they did was they would get to the side of it a ways. They had like a PVC pipe they would stick in the cage where it couldn't get its tail up. Mm -hmm. She didn't do a very good job with her PVC pipe. Right. She walked up to put a blanket over it, right. and she got a mouthful of that shit. My uh, my wife's grandmother got chased back in the house by a rabbit skunk. Oof! Not too long wow, ago. I, I've seen that. I got chased back in a truck one time. Uh, I was driving nights for an outfit and uh, pulled into the fuel rack and there was no lights and I heard something behind me and this skunk was chasing me around the truck. I got back in the truck and drove off. Came back a half hour later and he was gone. But they said that he was. Rabbit. I guess somebody had seen him during the day and mm -hmm. killed him. And yeah, this happened during the day, and uh, she was just trying to go outside to her car, and here this skunk came. She does not get around very well, so I don't know how she yeah, made it. Back. I, was I don't know how too. she made it back into the house without getting bitter, bitter sprayed. But uh, she did. She made it, and uh, she's in a standoff with this skunk, and it's uh, middle of the day. She calls her son, who lives a couple miles away, and he came up and shot it, but it was foaming at the mouth when he got there. What happened to grandma? Yeah. She got sprayed by a skunk. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize this, My but they said, because uh, I guess the rabies shots back in the day, you had to do it in the belly, and now it's not that way anymore. It's like three shots, and they just give it to you right in the muscle. 20, 26 of them, I think, is what it used to be, what right in your belly button. Same spot. Yeah. Mm, that'd be miserable. Right. I heard I heard it was pretty bad. My wife called me this morning about 6 o'clock, and, and she's from Silver City, New Mexico, and she got a deal on Facebook that they're having a big rabies problem there. They have, they're having right now. South Abilene, one of the little towns right now, has had problems with two animals they found that had rabies. How do they get that? It just it's a disease. It goes. I understand, but how? It's from saliva, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I know two or three guys that you know. Back to the fur market, they'd pick up roadkill, mm -hmm. and they'd get rabies shots themselves mm. all the vets i got a really close friend that is a head vet here in town that uh she gets a rabies shot mm -hmm. every year just yeah. like a dog my wife's cousin's a vet and she had to be fully vaccinated from rabies before she got into veterinary school and then like you said she gets a booster I don't think right. you can get rid of it. If you get rabies, I think you die. A human? I don't think there's any. I think once you, if yeah. once you get rabies, I don't think there's nothing they can do for you as a human being. I don't. What's the shot for then? To keep you from getting rabies, to prevent it. 
once you've gotten bit. No, oh, no, 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 no. Once you get rabies, just because you get bit by something doesn't mean you're going to have it. It's prevents you from getting. Once you get the disease, you get locked jaw, and I don't think you can survive. This seems silly. Well, look it up. You never see old Yeller? No, I never have actually. Yeah, yeah. I actually just heard of something here a while back about that. Uh, once you get it, like Jeff said. You, there's only like one in a hundred that will survive, and I and don't quote me on that, but it was it was a it wasn't very many people that survived. In other countries, a lot of people die from rabies. Yeah, you're right. It says it's always fatal. At the disease, as the disease progresses, the person may experience delirium, abnormal behavior, hallucinations, uh, hydrophobia, fear of water, and insomnia. The acute period of the disease typically ends after two to ten days. Once clinical once clinical signs of rabies appear, the disease is nearly always fatal. There's only a handful of people that have survived it. Yeah, it's a bad deal. Wow, right. I did not. I thought that the shot. No, it doesn't take a like That's you just get a bit right now. You like, got to get there. If you get bit right now, yeah, you need to go and start your rabies shots. You'll be you'll probably be fine. Right, but if you if you don't get Dick shots around. and shit, your ass is dead. Wow. I, I did not know that. Yeah, well, that, that's why these states you can't give your dog rabies shots personally. It's all through the dog pounds and mm-hmm. stuff, uh, and it's pretty followed. Like if you had a dog that bit somebody, and he didn't have his rabies shots, you're they almost force you to go in and go through the rabies shot vaccine as he had rabies uh now you guys you get rabies shots every year on your dogs no down there? i don't i don't know dogs? that ollie's la- well when when i send ollie to the vet yeah. i get him to him but we're not i mean he's i don't a, know if lou has i mean pr- i think he's got should. i think he's got his initial I, shots yeah, they, he he probably you need to have them done every year when you take him to the vet. But I'm the same way with Ollie because I don't think about it. But um, yeah, a long time ago, I think when the, my dad used to give dogs some shots himself, and then they changed the law sometime where you can't do that anymore. Right. right. Early in my year, if you could get it, you could buy it uh, and, and give it to them yourself. But here in this California, Oregon, Washington, I think Idaho too. Uh, I'm not sure. You give that dog a rabies shot, and it's good mm-hmm. for one year. And then the second shot's good for three years. And then you do that every three years throughout the life of the dog. And in my counties, the, the county dog official sends you a notice. In fact, our house dog right now, my wife's got to take in because they sent a notice her three-year deal was up she's taking it in this mm-hmm. morning to get we, we get rattlesnake shots here for our dogs i bet you don't have to do that up there do you yeah depends what area you're in uh now at the coast there's no snakes but there's a few snakes over here i never did it because i wasn't hunting that kind of country it's turkey season here and i'm i'm you petrified got- of snakes what, Petrified uh, I'm going to change the subject up just a little bit, Stan, because I've got to do it because of where you live at. My question okay. is, have you ever had an encounter of anything you thought was a Bigfoot or have you seen a Bigfoot ever? I've had close friends that talk about it that I believe. Some of them that open their mouth, <laughs> I don't believe. But... <laughs> But I do have one fellow that said he's seen a dad, a mom, and a kid. At it's one someone time. you believe. Yeah. Uh, it's someone that I believe. But I, I don't know myself. I've been in the woods lots and lots and lots of times. I'm a pretty good tracker. I can drive down a road and see bobcat tracks and bears and all that. And I have never seen anything that I would say, yes, there he's there, but what I don't about know. tracks? Have you ever seen a track? See, that's, no. that, that's why I'm always on the fence on no. this is guys like you that are, because if there's anything that happens out here in the country, I've seen it because I've spent so many hours and so many miles on back roads and on 
ranches and just the middle of nowhere. And we don't have Bigfoots here, I'm assuming, because I've never seen anything that's like it. But I'm like you, but then I'll find somebody I know, and I've got two friends of mine that have seen it, and they've told me they're not liars. They would never lie to me about anything, and I trust them wholeheartedly. And they have no reason to make it up. So guys like that are always what makes me think, hmm, makes you wonder why. But there just can't be that many of them if there are if there are some, because not very many people ever see them. Right. Years ago, I got a call, or my buddy got a call, and he called me, and we went over to the coast. Supposedly, there was a Bigfoot over there and wanted it to bring our dogs. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I don't know how old a track it was or if it was a phony track, but I dropped all my dogs on the ground, and he did too, and all they did is wander around there and <laughs> piss on the tires and uh, act like, anything was there and that i did go to a thing like that and that was years ago what would you do uh, if you found one yeah no shit and then, what if they're not afraid of the dogs yeah what, what would you do I, I i don't know i i don't back in my younger years i'd have probably shot but i wouldn't now i think mm-hmm. different i'm like uh, you though i don't think if he's bothering my dog, I couldn't shoot one. Because too, too close to a human. I I don't think I, I could. here's the deal. If I went up in the woods and I had a gun and one of them was looking at me, if, I, now if he was coming at me and I thought he was going to hurt me, I probably would. But just to see one in a tree or standing there, I don't I, think I could shoot one because I think there's some dumbass in that suit right there, and I'm going to go to jail for murder. Is what I'm going to think. And I just but but boy, <laughs> one if you got one to get, I'd get it mounted and put in the lodge if I shot one. Would you get him like menacing, or would you like oh, get him like I, in he'd a, be a yeah. mean motherfucker? If I had one, I'd have his teeth gnarled out. And... Oh no, I'd put him in like a smoker's jacket <laughs> and like with his legs crossed. That's how. That's how I'd mount him. I went to school with the girl, and she asked me one time about Bigfoots if I believed in them. I said, "Oh yeah." I said, "We got one mounted at the lodge." Oh, that is awesome. I thought, how out of touch can you be with reality to think someone's got one mounted somewhere? But I just. What's the weirdest shit you've ever seen in all them backwoods? What's the weirdest thing you've ever come up on out in the woods? Well, we create a buddy of mine and I created a weird thing. He was a county government trapper that I run with. And he had a buddy down the road that was another trapper for another county that was helping him in his county. And he had a sister that had a chimpanzee for a pet so we took that chimpanzee up in the woods where that other guy hunted and on a dusty road and led him down the road about two miles out to pick up window we created a weird (laughs) situation (laughs) (laughs) guys get screwed with other guys (laughs) how long did how but How long did that take we, before everybody was calling everybody to see that they saw a chimpanzee? About two days. About two days yeah. that it, it came out. There was out. a ranch. And then truth, truth finally came out. There was a ranch out. in South <laughs> Texas that they had some uh, monkeys on. And I don't know if they were there to pick olives or whatever it was, but it was pretty common guys on deer leases would see monkeys, and supposedly they all are gone now. Right. But what would you do out in the woods if you saw a damn chimpanzee in a tree, Andy? Let him be. That's where he belongs. They're not meaner gonna, than hell. So not whip your ass. Oh, yeah, 100%. How old was this chimpanzee? Did about he ever get aggressive? Was, Did he ever get aggressive with his owner? I have no idea. That's the only time I've seen that. Oh, really? That chimp is... When that guy picked him up. There's some evil animals, boy. I tell you what, I watched that show on Netflix called Chimpanzee. Mm. Woo! Them suckers are mean as hell. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Mm. I've seen that one. Now, don't they have some down in Florida? Don't they I have I think they've got some... some monkeys in the Everglades now that are there. And if they're in, if they they could live in Louisiana that's... in the swamps and nobody even know about it. If I was a Bigfoot, that's where I would be, would be in the swamps of Louisiana. Too hot, too many mosquitoes. It ain't gonna bother Big, Bigfoot's Bigfoot. don't like mosquitoes any more than you do. Skin's very sensitive. <laughs> I mean, that's where I'd be at. But uh, that chimpanzee, that show on Netflix, man, them things are evil. And the way they'd kill them little monkeys and just 
Mm. Snap their old bones and eat them and stuff. Like, God almighty. Right, right. I guess they're in areas, there's thousands of them, like in Africa and certain places. Yeah, they places. start out, they'll eat your fingers off, and then they go to your genitalia. Mm. Hell to the no on that shit. That's the next move. <laughs> so in and that area, in that area at Brookings, you said there's a, mi- a bear for every square mile is what's estimated and stuff. How many bears can you kill in Oregon? Oh, you can get two. Is is the thing now nowadays? I was uh, clear back in my early years before there was a bear season. I was in a hound club. We had about 160, 170 members. And we promoted bear hunt then. We'd have a parade and have a float with a coon in a tree or uh, on the float. And you were kind of macho back then. Now you're just a son of a bitch if you're a bear hunter. <laughs> the animal rights people have got their foot in the door really yeah. bad. Especially. We created myself and about five other guys got together and we decided that the bears needed a tag because everybody was killing these bears. And uh, we put a five dollar promote promoted it through Fish and Game and got a bear tag put on. And two and a half dollars of that tag went to bear study. Uh, remember when that happened. What's the oldest bear that you've encountered? Do you know? Yeah. 27 that I can wow. remember. Because you can send a tooth in. You can send a tooth in and they cut the tooth and they count the rings in the tooth mm-hmm. like you would a tree mm-hmm. to age a tree. And fishing game, fishing game will send back a report. It takes about a year. 27 years old. That's a smart. Woof. And the bear's over. There's, the bears over in the coast usually aren't very big. Uh, most of them were uh, anywhere from 90 pounds to 150 pounds. Uh, I think it's lack of feed. Once in a while, you get a big bear. They got big bears over there now because these bears, they stopped the bear hunting with dogs. And there's a lot of bears and there's a lot of age on them mm-hmm. bears, too. They're getting bigger. You ever have a bear take a swipe at you and get you? I've been knocked down twice and bit in the foot once. Weird situations, but <laughs> you, you got bit so. in the foot by a bear. God almighty. Yeah. Hmm. It, it was really, really hot. And I went to bear hunting at night hmm. time because of them dogs can't stand it. And I bait a bear up in a creek and I had a log about three or four foot through that fell in the creek and it was old and rotten. And the bear was right at the creek with two dogs on it, baying it. And at night, you don't turn a flashlight on until you're mm-hmm. ready to shoot or that bear will leave or get you or something will happen. And I would frog crawling down this steep log and you know what i mean by frog crawling just squatted down just easing ahead and i had cork boots on well i got about 10 feet from the bear i had i was using a 44 mag pistol i had it cocked and flashlight in one hand and i hadn't pushed the light on yet and all the bark on that log left well, that put me right on top of the bear between two dogs. I dropped my flashlight and I went to kick him. I couldn't see nothing. Uh, and I had two, well, I had three dogs. One was backed off about 10 feet and the other two were three feet. And the bear run about 10 yards and turned around and stopped. And I got my flashlight and got him killed. Uh, and I got up to gather my dogs and see what was going on and I took a step and the whole sole of my left foot was gone. He bit he didn't puncture any wound me, but he tore a big gouge in my sock and tore the whole boot 
uh, really? the sole mm-hmm. off. Never got your foot though. Just wrecked your boot. Yeah. Never got my foot. I, I shit my <laughs> pants. I'll tell you. <laughs> How many shots did it take? How many shots does it normally take to bring them down? One to Where do you want to hit right? him? Just like a deer behind the shoulder? Between eyeballs. No. Oh, he lives long enough to eat you up. Then it, when you're in a situation like that, you just shoot him right in the ear or right in right. the face. He'll eat you, buddy. <laughs> just piss him off. Right between the eyes or right in the ear? Yeah. If you're behind him, put what's it in his what's ear. What's the biggest bear you've ever uh, gotten? I got a picture of him somewhere, and it was, I treated, I didn't kill it, a bad thing, it was right at Mount Shasta, we seen the track, turned the dogs loose, listened to the race, listened to the fight, uh, treed, knew there was a road closer to him, went to him, started up, and a deer, there was a deer season there, I'll get to the weight in a minute. He uh, seen me coming up the hill and my buddy and took off running because he knew he and he never tied any of the dogs up and the dogs were running all over and we got it all said and done, gutted him, got him on a certified scale. He weighed 702 pounds Ooh. with no gut. 800 pound bear or more. Wow. Mm. Yeah. He's big. That son of a bitch would eat you. And he didn't have he didn't have any hair on his butt, I think. And then about ten miles from there, there was a big garbage dump, and I think he lived in that garbage dump, sitting on his <laughs> ass all the time. Seven hundred pound bear, boy, eat your butt, God Almighty! You imagine go around a corner and find that sucker looking you face to face. See, my luck, I'm I'm such a bad shot, and I'd be so nervous. I'd be like Barney Fife out there with that 44. I'd Shoot. miss his face, and I'd just, like, nick his ear or something. Piss him off really good, Piss huh? him off. Just piss him off real good. <laughs> or I'd get him, like, right on the end it of the nose be- or something to where, you know, non-fatal shot. Just really tick him off. Yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd leave. Be the only thing that save me. I had a, had a, had a deal California season was still going, and we hunt up here in the northern part. There's a lot of lava flows and caves and stuff like that. And we had got after a bear. There was two of us hunting together, and we lost him in a roadless area. He couldn't hear him. And usually when you can't hear them, mm-hmm. they're in a hole. And we started in the area to walk through it to see if we could hear him. And all of a sudden, there was them dogs left, and you could hear them and treat a bear about 200 pounds. And this guy's daughter was there, and she wanted to kill this bear. He had his, both his daughters. We killed that bear, and I'd lost a real good dog, never showed up. I walked through there with my tracking equipment, and I got a signal, and we found the hole that that bear was in. And my signal was in there, and my dog was in there, uh, Mm -hmm. dead. And I went, got down on my belly and went to crawl into that hole, and about, and there was a rock on my right side that went in about three feet, and then it opened up into a room about all size of an average kitchen or something, you know, small, uh, and that bear come around that rock and opened his mouth about, well, he was probably a foot and a half from me. The only thing I could remember when I was backing out of there is, God damn, he had bad breath. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big hole, though, isn't it? We put, yeah, yeah. Some of those you can walk in. Uh, you do, ever had a mountain? Do they you make them, or do they? Walk. is it just a natural thing that they find and inhabit? Well, when Mount Shasta blew, all that lava went flowing all yeah. over this country. All the rocks clear up here in Oregon are lava flows from Mount Shasta. And there's lava flows to where there's tunnels that'll go in. There's ice caves in That's some of them. That's uh, badass. Yeah, it, it's rough. And it's rough on your dogs, too, because that lava right. part on Got their some- feet. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I never liked to hunt it because I was out of it. If I had a hard race in there with dogs and your dogs weren't feet weren't tough, you couldn't hunt for two weeks because they're laying out it's licking their palms. <laughs> you know, they can't right. get around. Um, bears click their teeth, don't they? Whenever they, is that, is that the sound you hear? Yeah, they'll pop their jaws, we call it. And that's like a, war- that's yeah, a warning sound? That's pretty loud, dude. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I got it in me, Jeff. What about a mountain lion? You ever had a mountain lion get after you or come out of a tree on you? No, I never have. I've treed lots of them over my life. Uh, they're... They're not mean. They don't run. They haven't got a lung on them. Uh, the hard thing about a mountain lion is getting him trailed, trailing him up, start a cold track, especially some of them toms that'll, that are just traveling country, you know, looking for females. Uh, you, know, you can, the old timers had dogs that would trail him for three days and the only time he caught up with it was when he made right. a kill. Slow down enough. Yeah. I never have thought of that. There was some old time hunter. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Del nope. Lee? Old, old, old hunters that all I did is guide uh, lions and bears and cougars and he took a train up here to, I got to meet him. He was an old, and I'd only been in dogs about a year, so I didn't do much talking. I was, I was real impressed, but there was some brothers. They roped lions back in the day in Arizona and down in there, and they'd rope them and sell them to people making movies and all that kind of stuff. And I got to meet him. Didn't know who he was at the time, just an old time guy that had a real southern slur and born and raised down in that country. And he made a living doing it, hunting Mexico for jaguars and all that kind and of stuff. And they rope them. I have heard of this guy. He roped them. I'm sure you have. If you uh he's got he's got some podcasts or somebody does that's got his mm-hmm. stories. Quite a famous, <clears throat> and hunter. you said they don't have a good set of lungs on them, so you can you can tire them out. Right. A lot of time when I first started hunting, there was still a lot of guys that bounty them. It was pretty good money, you know, like seventy five, eighty dollars for a female, and uh, they, that's how they made a living. One guy I knew over in that Roseburg country, him and his wife. Uh, they had an old Ford Ferguson tractor and a flatbed trailer with a wood stove on it, and that's all they did is hunt cougars wow. and bounty them. What's the most amount of money you made in a year? Don't uh, doing it the way you did. I did. I, I did it for fun, mainly. I guided it two years and decided I didn't like. I didn't like the people I got. Uh, right. You like you like you did it all for well, yourself. I didn't. I did it all for myself. I was involved in hound clubs. I was field trial marshal for 20 years uh, in one club. And I'm, in fact, I think I still am the waymaster for Southern Oregon. Uh, somebody wanted to, we had contests a lot of the biggest cat of the year, biggest bear of the year. Uh, then they'd have weekend hunts, biggest coon of the year or for the weekend. And I was a Southern Oregon Waymaster. They have to bring it to me by seven o'clock Sunday night and I'd weigh it and then call it in. For, usually it was for trophies. It was never was right. for money. Do you think you're the last of the uh dog runners like you were? No. No. There's Lot. I drive down the road this day and age and went to that fur thing and Oregon United Sporting Dogs Association and there's a lot of a lot of twenty year olds, thirty year old guys in well, the that's dogs. That's refreshing to hear. Uh, but they're fighting it, you know, like anything else. They're trying to take it all. There's no bear hunting with dogs or cougar hunting with dogs in Oregon. 
and none in California anymore. <clears throat> Measure 18 took that about 25 years ago. It's kind of sad. I go to a field trial and I'll be, there's a major field trial in California every year by different organizations. And that's just a big get together and see how fast your dogs are. They'll do a bear drag and a coon drag and all that. I go down there, my buddy and I went down last year and we used to know everybody there and we only know two or three <laughs> people. The rest of them are 30 year old people. You know, all, all, all the old timers are yeah. died off, dying off. Yeah. Know? That's, I mean, it's, it's good that the tradition's carrying on because like you said, they're trying to take everything away from us and it's not going to be long. And I'm afraid outdoorsmen like me and you, I, I, I'm afraid there's not many more generations left. If they, if, if they can get it the now, way they want you go it. Around, you go around to them field trials and you go to like the trap and first sale and stuff. And I look around there and there's four or five kids and 40 guys yeah. my age, you know, and that tells you right there that it's going yes. out the door. Yeah. So I just have to say, I, I think I seen the best right. of it. That's right. all I can say. You're not the last, but you saw the best of it. Right. That makes sense. Right. And that's what that's what made me call Jeff the other day. I've only watched about four or five of you guys' podcasts. And in them podcasts, it was a little bit said about wolves. Yeah. Not much. And I thought, this has got to get out. We're getting overrun by wolves. In the last 10 years, first wolf tracks that I've seen was in northern uh, Oregon. I was on a deer hunt and I've seen them. I called a buddy of mine that worked for fishing game and he told him where it was and he went up there. And next thing I hear, and uh, there was a wolf called OR7 uh, came into Oregon here and went clear into California. And now Washington's got a wolf problem. Oregon's got a wolf problem. California, northern, they've got wolves down there. I don't know what kind of problem, but I hear them all the time. I don't know for sure. Don't know that much about wolves. I got some pictures of them locally here on uh, on trail cams. And uh, I think they're coming in in white trucks. The government's bringing them in. And I really think these wolves are an anti-hunting program, to tell you the truth, because you're going to wake up one day and not have any, we don't have any deer herds anymore like we did, and we're not having any elk herds. I understand Canada is flying wolf packs now because they got a caribou herd that's about one-fourth what it used to be 10 years wow. ago. And they're killing wolves out of airplanes. Hmm. There's right above my house, about 20 miles, there's a big ranch and fish and game is in there. And they'll buy these cows that are, are proven killed by a wolf. They'll, but how many cows do they lose that never get seen until it comes gathering time? Yeah. And they say a wolf needs to eat seven to eight pounds of meat a day. You do the numbers on that and we ain't going to have anything yeah. left. I don't understand the fascination with bringing these creatures back. I just, I do not in the wilds of Alaska, the Northwest territories in the Yukon where there's no people at. And it's, I mean, I, but anywhere you've got farming livestock and ranching, you know, people got to realize you got to feed yourself and we're taking away the food sources. And I, I, don't, I just don't understand the end game with all these wolves. And I don't understand how the people are letting it get by. I just, I, I think everybody ought to take care of them themselves. Don't call it in. Just get rid of them is what you should do if you live there. So you think that it's a, you think it's a There's play a to get rid of hunting and just that way of life by just the mess, uh, decimate the deer, elk, caribou population. I believe it is. Because if you ever seen fish and game, or, or I say fish and game, we'd be lost without them. But uh, I can't remember where I'm going with this. If you 
you know that anything that disappears, like uh, hound hunting, you'll never get right. it back. Yeah, you can't. It's it's I five quarter and the colleges and the do gooders that are don't kill Bambi and that kind of stuff that vote this stuff in. There's more of them than there yeah. is of us, and we're losing. And I think they're going to wake up one day and say, hey, there's no deer herds left and there's no elk herds left. we got to shut the hunting mm-hmm. down. And they will. And you'll never get it back. In the meantime, what do you do? Fly these Idaho flies wolves at times that they get heavy in areas. I've heard that. Uh, it's time to get the numbers down. Yeah. There's a $50,000 bounty right here not 20 miles from where i'm sitting right now uh i guess three wolves got killed and there's a fifty thousand dollar bounty on and uh, somebody that knows something really? about it i've heard that wanting people to snitch uh, yep there's uh it's been three or four killed in the last four or five years one of them they killed and i heard they poured gas on it and lit it had a collar on it and they found it right huh, huh. I, colorado <clears throat> just bought 10 wolves from oregon is what i've heard he took them to colorado and dropped them in areas and i've heard that on this podcast this guy was talking about uh, they got a million dollars of wolf involved in money in this well they're fixing to screw up because they're about to get to wyoming where the where they're going to shoot the shit out of them and get rid of them which they need to do well yeah That's... uh you know there, there's there's states like i think michigan up in there that's got lots of wolves and there and those sheep farmers and, and cattle farmers are having a hell of a time living with them uh, i guess they got a lot of them herd them guard dogs and big white dogs that guard them herds and they're they're getting along i guess and they want to teach us to to live like that the, i guess the st- I minnesota know. in the northern part of minnesota which would be brainerd to the canadian border i think the wolves are really bad there and they're wiping out in their deer herd i had seen a study one time and i wish i'd known the exact numbers but it was in idaho i'm pretty sure they had an area we'll call it elk mountain <clears throat> just the area i don't know what it was but when they introduced the wolves, they had an elk population of 15,000 elk, and they brung in and released 25 elk, wolves or something. Now they've got 250 wolves, and they've got 1,500 elk now. And those they're just, they right, wipe out. Right. And, well, you, know, you know, these these guides in Montana and Idaho that their families have been making a living guiding, I call them Texas elk hunters. You know, there's a lot of money down there in Texas, and those guys elk hunt every year. Some of them come clear up in here, and they don't, they'll hunt a whole season, not even see an elk anymore. Well, them guys are going broke. You can't guide an elk hunt if you ain't got any right. elk. Nope, that's why I'd be putting them wolves to sleep every time I got a chance. I just wouldn't tell. I wouldn't tell nobody. Right. So yeah, be yeah. the way to do it. Oh, what? Well, but that's the main reason I called you, Jeff, is to maybe in some of these podcasts you can talk more about these wolves. I don't know the actual numbers and anything. It's just what I'm seeing as an old man looking here and stuff here. And it's even clear over at the coast. Some of them dog hunters over there saying they're seeing wolf tracks. They're over in that Coos Bay country on the creeks and stuff. Well, they're taking over, and they have litters. So it's going to be a major problem. The litters are getting right, right. If the and our forefathers spent millions of dollars to get rid of them so they could survive in right. this country. Yeah, the people are going to have to take it over and do it themselves. What you don't need though is Redneck Johnny to go shoot five or six of them and then go tell everybody about it. Just. Gut shoot them well, and leave them and let them go, you know. And but they'll spend more. They'll, well, they'll spend more that, money to try to catch a guy for shooting a wolf than they will someone that kills someone almost. 
They'll put more resources into it. Bunny yeah. huggers are the craziest freaking people in the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy times. It's well, listen, this has been uh it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed hearing your stories and uh, hopefully more people will be, uh, you know, aware of what's going on in this world and the wolves that are getting released and maybe, maybe something will happen where we can get a hold on it, but we appreciate your time. Not, not a problem. Uh, one of these times, if I run into somebody that knows a lot more about them wolves, I'm going to, I'll hook you guys up. Maybe you can do something great. with yeah. him. You run across anybody. Uh, yeah. Put them yeah. in contact with Jeff and we'd love to do that. That'd be a lot of fun. Will you take care of yourself up there? If I get back up your way ever, I'm going to come by you breakfast one morning and sit and visit with you in person. I'd love to sit and talk and chit chat with you more. That'd be good. Jeff, just give me a call. I'm, I'm usually available. I'm retired now and the wife's retired and we got a big fifth wheel trailer and we want to travel and, uh, Hell, you never know. I might call you up in your town and say I'm here. I got a place for you. You come see us. You take care of yourself. God bless you, my friend. Thank you very much for being on with us. Bye. You bet. Um, Talk to you later. I love talking to people that have got a story like that, that have done it and seen it. What a difference in time. Just like him talking about as a kid. I look at the things I did as a kid today that there's no way in hell you'd let your boys do. Nope. Not in a million years. And I wonder why. Are we, are we too overprotective now? Probably. Even things you've done as a kid, you won't let your kid hardly do. Like him riding his bike down to our house, you won't let him ride unless you follow behind him. Right. Why? I don't know. I mean, we just never have. But, I mean, why, though? I mean, back in the day, it was not, nobody thought nothing of that. Right. It's just, it's like if you would, at his age, we when we were living where we live right now, when you were his age, you had a bike. Mm-hmm. If you had a road to the other side of town or to baseball practice, wouldn't think nothing of it. Did y'all get the sex offender list like we get now? No. Oh. We don't even know that he had him. Oh. I mean, I know we had sex offenders. I just don't think there was a list. Right. I mean, that that's, but I mean, that's just, that's, are you worried about him getting raped? I'm not really worried about anything. I don't guess. I don't know. But but that's just the difference I'm talking is the way we raise our kids now compared. Speaking of bears and mingle, have you seen the video of the guy with the bear at the zoo and the guy comes out and the and the bear chases him. He's in his he was a zookeeper. Was or, it a bear? Or was it a gorilla? It was a bear. Was it a I've bear? seen the gorilla one too, where the guy stands in the cage. That Somebody guy's, gets locked up. Do you blame the guy? I'd have locked myself in that little deal too. He was scared to death. No, I mean like somebody some something fucked up, I yeah, guess. Yeah, somebody opened a gate up and the damn right. gorilla and the guy started screaming and ran and hidden in the corner. And locked and I don't blame him at all. That that would be the animal. Outside of a grizzly bear, I think a gorilla would be the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- this is a bear, and the guy gets in the. Um, this bear's trying to get him. And he jumps in the little canal between where the people sit, the moat kind of, and he's in there. I think that, I have seen that, that fucking bear starts going down the deal, comes to a ledge, and the bear tries to jump on him. Bear can't swim very well. Guess oh, what the guy really? does? Guy grabs him by his head, and he's drowning the freaking bear. The bear finally goes off, and the guy climbs out and runs and gets gets out of there. I didn't know they couldn't swim very well. well I this, knew they couldn't run downhill. Well, this one this one can swim probably as good as a man can, but the man was more was smarter and got behind it and grabbed the bear by its ears where he couldn't get its head around on him and was dunking him, trying to get away from him. Mm-hmm. That's a life-or-death struggle right there when a bear's trying to eat your ass in the water. Have you seen this? So Gordon Ramsay's got a pub in Albany, New York. Squatters have taken it over. He's got it for sale for $16.1 million, and they took it over. And now they're threatening legal action if he kicks them out. What the fuck is wrong with our country? This is another one of these. We could have a what the fuck is wrong with our country every day on shit. How in the hell can anybody go in someone's business house Whatever it is, and just squat, and they have any rights at all. They ought to have the right to get their ass kicked. Oh, it sounds like there was already a deal in place, and now the squatters are there. The, 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 you Shocking should be able- photo shows squatters holed up in the trendy pub, one of whom can be seen barefoot sprawled out across the black leather sofa. Anyway, Gordon should have went to the local motorcycle gang and said, here's $15,000 cash. Take care of this for me. Squatters also slapped up a legal warning sign on the front door defending their takeover and caution any eviction attempt, the sun reports. I just, they shouldn't have any rights. 
But don't they have to get mail there? Isn't that the loophole or I something? Don't, I like, don't know what their loophole is, but they, people use this all the time. There are people that are making a living right now. I saw in L.A. they had a guy that was squatting at a house. He was charging rent to other, other squatters. <laughs> he was an entrepreneur squatter. Well, you got to, you know. But I just, you, you, those, those stories are refreshing. Could you imagine your house, though? Y'all going on vacation and coming back in some jackasses. Oh, yeah. other, and you're supposed to walk away. Fuck that shit. Go beat their ass. Take notice there that we occupy this property and at all times there is at least one person in occupation. Any entry or attempt to enter into these premises without our permission, even though I don't own the fucking place, is therefore a criminal offense as any one of us will you uh, who is in physical possession is opposed to such entry without permission. If you attempt to enter by violence or by threatening violence, we will prosecute you. The notice goes on to say that <laughs> violations could end up in uh, six months imprisonment and or find of 6200 bucks. I think what we need is some old school shit. You know what? You're going to do that. I'm going to beat your ass. And when I get done beating your ass, if you want to call the cops, you're going to. When I get out of jail or make my bond, I'm going to come back and I'm going to beat your ass again. Eventually, you're going to get enough ass beaten. You're going to quit doing this crap. But there has to be some backing by the authorities on this stuff. It's stupid that you have any rights. What law are they like? I, it's like for single mom, basically, isn't it? Like. Like what? You couldn't go in and like late, no notice, like, hey, all of a sudden you don't live here anymore. It's not just a single mom. It was a shitty being a shitty landlord. It, it was to protect- Renters should have some rights. Right. You, you know, Like if you rent someone a house and you say, listen, I'm going to provide this, this, and this for you, and your air conditioning system goes out and you're the landlord, you need to fix their air conditioning. Right. I mean, there are some shitty slumlords out there. There's yeah. no doubt. They find these loopholes to do this now where you don't have to be a loop. The people put their house up for sale in Beverly Hills. Right. And- 10 people will come move in there. They'll look for the ads. Nobody lives there. We move there and we do this. And they've got the utilities on because they're showing the house. Right. And they then they can't turn. The biggest thing is you can't turn the shit off. That's bullshit. But I, I, there, there's a judge somewhere that ain't got no balls and no common sense that has let this happen over and over and over again. And it should be. I, I've seen where some states are now passing some laws. Squatter laws. The squatter laws. Get rid of them. And they should. Nobody wins by this. No. Nobody. And it's not even fair. that. But that's this whole mentality we have where everybody's a victim. These people are victims. You know, yeah, get your ass a job. It's just interesting that there is a law loophole that they found that protects them. Oh, I, I saw a, a lady on the trading post in Wichita Falls wanting to know the exact term. She's wanting to start squatting now, wants to make sure. And people were like giving her deals. And God. I wrote on there, I said, get a fucking job. In Texas. Yeah. And guess what they did in my comments? Took it down. Took it my, mine down. It's hateful. You know, I didn't call her a bitch or worthless slut like I wanted to. I just said, get a damn job. But I don't, I, I, can't, I just can't imagine. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be for people? It'd be awful. Especially in states where you have, where you can, like New York or California. Liberal states. Where it's just. Sorry, they're yeah. here till they're not. The people in California and New York City, not always upstate New York, but New York City, you know, upstate New York, prayers got to those police officers who got killed yesterday at Syracuse. But you have all these rules and laws set up to protect people that don't do shit. Right. And you've it, and then you make it hard on people that do things legally. And then the New York City can't understand why their business is leaving. Or California. I mean, nobody everybody's leaving those states. Wild times. Texas is going to surpass California in uh, electoral votes one of these days. Think so? I think eventually we're going to. We're going to get more people. There's more people coming here. Texas will be blue then. I don't know about that. I, I don't. I think a lot of people are finally getting sick up. I don't. I think there's a lot of people that were blue that ain't going to be blue at this next election. I mean, it's evil versus good. I mean, that's what you're voting on right now. If you're voting for Democrats, you're voting for evil. Yeah. And if 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 you, if you want to see babies aborted after they're three months old, then keep voting to blue. You know, there's tons of stuff you can talk about that they've done. It's me, me and um, a gen- an older gentleman in our area that's real well known, very well liked person. We're talking at ba- kid baseball the other day, and we were talking about that because he lives in a town with a lot. Of, used to have a lot of Democrats, and just what they stand for now. And we talked about before Obama was in office when it was uh, Clinton and Bush running against each other at Atros Pro. Yeah. There was not a whole lot of differences between being a Republican and a Democrat. Probably just some social issues. It's very few. One's for the worker, one for the company, basically. Yeah, I mean, it was just some, it was little deals, you know? And it's not that way no more. Right. And now we've got five generations of welfare families, and it's just it's it's just a train wreck. I, I'm going to ask you this real quick while we're, while we're talking. This is kind of getting off subject of the wolves and everything, but... On my on my 
on my social media yesterday, there was a debate with some people I went to high school with. They were debating these student loans. Mm -hmm. If you're 56 years old and you're still paying on a student loan from when you're 18 or 19 yeah. years old, something's fucked up anyways. Yeah. First, a girl I went to school with, she was, you, people just don't understand, you know, you're paying 10 years, this note or 20 years, and you don't miss a payment, and you're paying 600 a month and whatever it is. Uh, something's wrong if you're still paying your student loan. Second right. of all, 30 years later, if you took a loan, if, later. and I had some friends that did this, they took out every student loan they could get. They lived in the nicest apartment. Right. They had a nice car. They went on spring break. They went snow skiing every year. And now guess what? They have a minimal job. They don't make much money and they're bitching because they're still paying off school loans. Mm -hmm. Well, you shouldn't went on fucking spring break five or six years in a row. The one thing I will say is that your generation was sold a bad batch of goods. Because your generation was told, and my generation was told, that the only way for you to make it in the world is to get go to college. Right. So there was a lie in that. Then the government got involved, and they started guaranteeing student loans. So colleges got more and more expensive because they knew the government was going to come in and pay the pay the way, basically. So I mean, yeah, it sucks. You know, you were told you got to go to college. That's the only way you're going to get a good job. And then you come out only to find that that is horseshit. And but when, when, a lot of it's meaningless, a lot of it's low pay. I mean, just shitty deal all the way around. But, but I mean, you're right. I mean, you you ultimately you're an adult. You signed on the dotted line. You knew what you were getting into. I want one time to pay the bill. Give me one example of why someone should have their student their, their school loan forgiven one reason now i don't i mean small town hospitals hire a doctor they can't get a doctor here if the if the if the state wants to or the federal government wants to forgive that loan because they're giving a service to an area yeah i don't have a problem with that i don't but if you're also going to school to be a doctor you're gonna make a lot of money i'd be able to pay the motherfucker back yeah i don't know i mean how much is it you think to be a doctor? You think well, two if, quarter million dollars in student that's, loan debt? That's what I would guess now. And that's gotten more expensive now. Now, here's another thing I was going to say. When I was in college, my first couple of years in school, I wrote a check for my, I didn't make a lot of money, but I could pay for my tuition. Yeah, you can't do that now. No, no, I could write a check for, I don't even know what what it was per hour, but if I took 12 hours at school at Midwestern yeah. State you could University, I could write a check for, $1,500 or something would pay for my tuition for the semester. Average medical school student loan debt is around is $194,000, 280 bucks. So $250,000. But when I went to school, no, 194,000. So $200,000 basically. Roughly, yeah. When when but when I was in school, you could afford to go to college. You might be poor, you may not have a lot of money, but you could at least go to school. Nowadays, it's eight thousand dollars for that same semester right well a kid can't accumulate that kind of money no so he can't pay for that so what they need to They're do forced if, into a system where they have to take the loans right. if they want to go to college or the government needs to step in and say whoa whoa hold on we're going to cap the cost of if you want to go to harvard or yale or smu tcu and pay fifty thousand dollars a year to go to school or semester that's your business right here that's available for you but we ought to have state schools where you can go to college and get a degree at a reasonable price, something you could do. Don't borrow a quarter of a million dollars to go to college to be a teacher. Sorry for teachers. I'm not knocking teachers. I got tons of respect. My wife's got a degree to be a teacher. Andy has a degree to be a teacher. Not knocking that at all. But don't go $250,000 in college debt. When you're going to make 30 yeah, a year coming out. Yeah, it doesn't make fucking sense. Right. And, and, and my argument with this girl was, is listen, me and Tony had to get an SBA loan to start our business. Yeah. $250,000. Guess what kind of government's given SBA loan refunds? None. Yeah. They're not paying those off. Every plumber or electrician in the country had to go to work for another plumber and electrician to learn his craft. Now, most of those guys went and got paid while they were working 10 or $15 an hour. They worked their way up for three years and then they branched off to start their own company. Guess That's how what? they got their money? They had to borrow that money and pay it back. That's what pisses me off is these entitled people. You went to college. You should have got you a fucking degree. Maybe you should have taken an economics class and realize you're getting upside down on what you're borrowing. You can't pay back. That's the American dream, though. To what? Be upside down all the time. Well, they damn sure we're, as I a mean, society, we're doing a good job of it. Well, yeah. Look at credit card debt. I mean, it just it is what it is. Most people are upside down. Uh, 200 grand does not include undergraduate debt. Okay. okay. So you're probably right at 
if, if, if you go to undergraduate school right now, if you go to Tarleton State, State University, it's on, it's part of the A&M system now. It's in Steamville. It's a really good school. It's growing 10,000 students. I bet you're going to pay $15,000 a year to go to college here. Right. That's room, board, and tuition. So four years, if you got your – and most kids can, can get out of school in three years now because they got so many college courses yeah. and take in high school. But three years, you're going to be in debt $50,000. Right. Okay. Fifty thousand dollars should not set you back the rest of your fucking life. No, shouldn't. I mean, if you pay four hundred dollars a month back, it's supposed to be at three percent interest. I think. I can't remember. It's going to take you ten years to pay that back at four hundred a month, probably. Right. I don't know. Everything's so screwy. But that's another thing. Is like we, we're a pretty advanced society. I would say. Yes, I'd say you're right. If you look at the things that people built back in the day and you just look at the the way people lived, like now you got to go to college. I just don't understand why a doctor couldn't, can't be an apprentice. Like if that's what you want to do, just fucking follow a doctor. He'll tell you what to do. Don't cut that right there. They'll bleed out. I mean, you should have a basic knowledge. You should have a knowledge of human anatomy and like, but I mean, how much of it is just on the job training? Like building, building a, a, a house or building a building. We built cathedrals. I mean, we built all these magnificent structures. Nobody had a fucking engineering degree. And now, if you, you know, we have a group of architects that hunt out here. And I'm like, why can't, why do you have to go get all of this debt when you could just be the teacher for the next generation? Like, hire a bunch of, hire a bunch we, of prospects and just teach them how to build one, a fucking building. One of the architecture firms that hunts with Seth, his daughter's going to school to be an, to architect. Be an architect. Well, she could just work in her dad's office. He's does a great make, architect and learn everything without having to spend all that money. Does not make sense. No. Um, how about, but there's laws in place to where you have to have all these licenses. If you're going to, you know, build skyscrapers and I mean, fuck. I think just a house, but like an electrician, yeah. If you want to be an electrician, you got to go work for an electrician yeah. to become a master electrician. Plumber, and HVAC. then I'm assuming you take a test from the state. I don't. I'm, I'm assuming Probably. you do. But why can't we take that same deal into being a doctor, like you said? Because all three of you boys are really sharp. Mm-hmm. All three of you guys are real, real sharp. Y'all could go work for a cardiologist, and in five years, y'all could be a cardiologist. Yeah, and just learn from him and go to work with him every day and learn stuff. And there's basic things. Somebody's like, you don't know shit about medicine. You're right, I don't. But I can tell you what, you take the sharper minds and they can learn all that stuff. Yeah. How do you think doctors in World War II were there? You think they all went to medical school? <laughs> right. I think a lot of those older doctors in World War II learned there on the job training. Yeah. A lot of things they learned how to do. And you're taking sharp minds and you're making them go through all this process that they don't want to become a fucking doctor now. Right. Or whatever it is. Why would you want to strap yourself with a quarter million dollars in debt? Yes. I mean, I we had a doctor that hunted with us that quit being a doctor to sell real estate because of all the fucking insurance crap. Yeah. We are the insurance our kind we are ruined by taxes, insurance and regulations. Overregulated. We are so overregulated. So much. And then everybody's like, well, why do the jobs go to Mexico? Uh, less regulation is why. Mm-hmm. You know, the wages, Ford can pay the same wages in, Mex- in Monterey to build a pickup that they do in Detroit, and they'd save a shitload of money building it in Monterey, Mexico, because of not all the government regulations down there. Now, they're not paying them people as much money. We all know that. But if they did, they still would be better off to go down there. All started under Reagan. Did he start all what? The, the, Shipping the jobs over. Well, NAFTA turned out to not be such a great thing either. I, I just I don't understand why we can't take up our country. I don't understand why this wolf deal is such a big issue right now. Um, there was something else that happened in the world I was going to ask you about. Oh, what did you do? You know anything about the two ladies that were missing in Oklahoma? Mm-mm. There's two ladies that were missing. They found the bodies last night. But uh, a a lady went to church went to a church and they had a new pre- a preacher. I think came you were in. telling me about this. Yes. The new preacher came in and his wife went with this lady to go get her uh, visitation with her kids or to pick her kids up or something, and they didn't see him from again, ever right. again. The grandma killed him. Crazy. And the preacher guy that she's dating, and another, there's four people involved. It's sick. Poor mm-hmm. lady. A new lady in town was going to go make friends with this woman, was going to help her go get her kids. They found all the body, They found the bodies yesterday. Supposedly the old lady had confessed to it. She had help from four people. Now, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. I'm going to be the bad guy here for a minute. Not on bad, on this on good or bad because it's evil. But if you're going to kill somebody, don't get other people involved with you. Right. 
I don't give a shit if you got two people or ten people involved, more than one, the chances of you getting caught go up a ton. Because a ton. Mm-hmm. someone's going to crack. Yeah. If you're going to do that, don't get anybody else involved first. I don't know, and I'm not taking these people's side by any means. I just oh, every time I see these group deals like that, I'm like, well, why, are you shocked you got caught? I mean, a lot, a lot of people know you can't have an attendance there with you and help you do this. No, it's terrible though. All right, anything else going on? You got turkey hunters this weekend? Turkey hunt? Yeah, gonna get cold again too. Thank goodness. I thought the cold weather was over. Fifty seven's a high on Saturday now. I'll take it. I'll take it because we're looking at May right in the face. Yep, it's right around the corner. Then it's dove season. We'll be here. I've got some weekend dove day or weekday doves le- dove hunts left for a private corporate group. I have some waterfowl hunts in November. I had a really some good days come up the other day. The guys can't make their hunt this year. They pre booked, so I've got a couple of days in November left still. We can get we got an increase to three specs this year. We're gonna be shooting three specs every day. Gonna be a lot of peanuts. Should be a good, good, good season. We've got a good start on water right now. If we could just get some rain to finish it up, we are wet right now. We just need finally at the runoff rain stage, and it is the wet time of year starts in the next eight weeks for us. Which means we won't get any until September. Probably we'll be not starting all the way over. Again. But but this our way historically our wettest month times is from April fifteenth till June fifteenth, and we're starting that right now. And we got thunderstorm chances tonight, and we got really good rain chances over the weekend while Andy's turkey hunting. Oh, fun. Thank y'all for listening to us. God bless y'all. Uh, Hemp Hill Farms, get some pet CBD oil. They got a sale right now. Tell them Jeff Stanfield told them to get a call. Bye. Well, love you. Bye. Watch for deer. Go check out all of our sponsors. Go check out Alpha Outdoor Specialties, MLR Graphics, Boss Shot Shells, Pacific Calls, BHP 25, Dive Bomb Industry, Dirty Duck Coffee, Shin Gear, Looking Glass Podcast, Lucky Duck, Mallard Bay, Ducks Unlimited, Double T British Kennels, Mossberg, Hemp Hill Farm, and Stanford Outfitters.